That's the moment we spend 10 minutes-ish revving up slow burn to this moment where the kid takes his uncle's hand and loves him and reveres him. And the uncle gives that love back. And it's totally silent except for the uncle saying, and here we are to the persimmon again, in your own time. You're listening to Easy Cook Bear, a food and culture show about how we cook, connect, and create. My name is Lee Sean. Together with my guests, we'll be sharing stories, swapping recipes, and exploring the creative processes of people who make art, culture, food, music, and more. Easy Cook Bear. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Easy Cook Bear. I'm Lee Sean, as always, and our guest this episode is a Brooklyn based writer and director of film and the theater. Gary Jaffe, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. So the original impetus of getting you on the show was to talk about persimmons, because this has been a a recent obsession of yours, a new obsession of yours. So let's start with persimmons, and then we'll talk about writing and directing and all of those things and tie everything together. But persimmons, discuss. Absolutely. Well, this year, I've been alone, a lot of it. I live alone in Brooklyn, and really since March, with some exceptions, I've been on some form or another of solitary confinement. And one of the things that's happened because of that confinement is going on deep dives. And that can range from watching every single Studio Ghibli film, many of which I've watched with you remotely, which has been delightful. It can be listening to every single Bruce Springsteen album. It can be reading every single Jane Austen novel. And most recently, it's been Persimmon mania, persimmon mania. Essentially, what happened is an errant persimmon was delivered to me in my blue apron box, because that's how I cook is blue apron. And I ate it and it was delicious. And it was sweet and nutty and a little weirdly savory. And I was totally into it. So I went to the store and got some more persimmons, not doing any research, except for generally knowing that you had to wait until they were a little soft tried them and immediately got that famous chalk mouth horrible taste and was like, what is this? What happened? And I think partially because of that immediate high risk, high reward generation of interest, we'll call Mm, it, that central tension perhaps between like the delight of persimmon and the stress of it. I was like, I must know everything about this fruit. And I went on something of a inexpert quest for wisdom about the persimmon, including going to the store several times in one day to keep buying persimmons, which the cashiers made fun of me for, including at various points, literally buying every Fuyu persimmon they had. They had six and I wanted all of them. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, should I leave some for others? And I said, no, I will have them all for myself. I currently have six in my apartment right now. I'll talk more in a bit about the differences between Fuyu and Hachia and what the deal is with them. But basically, you know, I did a deep dive into persimmon land and I haven't gotten tired of them yet. And I'm always happy to eat them. I'm delighted when they are delicious. I'm getting much better at not eating them when they are not. And uh, it's been a nice way to round out the year, I suppose. So you've talked about being kind of a completist or someone who goes deep when you get into something, whether it's with Miyazaki Hayao and Studio Ghibli or with now Persimmons. Is this like a COVID sparked thing or have you always been into like getting into something and then getting obsessed and going deep? This has been happening since I was a kid. When I was little, I had these dinosaurs, you know, plastic dinosaur toys that on the bottom said their name. I knew each one of them and I knew details about each one of them to degrees that I could not remember now. It was to such an extent that when I was in preschool, my dad had to, you know, walk up and down the halls basically trying to memorize all of the dinosaurs and the details about them to keep up with me. So I've always had something of an obsessive streak. Okay. And it does tend to shift 
like when I was little, it went from dinosaurs to marine life to the stars and constellations to Greek myths, etc. And um, I think that this year has had me left to my own devices in a certain way, which yeah. has allowed old patterns, like old deep cut patterns to come out, which has been honestly delightful, like a real connection with self, with deep self, with kind of when left to my own devices, what do I do? Oh, I get really into things. That's great. You know, it's fun. It's fun to have that sort of dimensional understanding of a thing, particularly when we're talking about artists or writers or fruit. <laughs> yeah, I want to explore how this plays out in other parts of your creative practices. But getting back to persimmons for a bit. So you've discovered persimmons. There are two main kinds that you can get, right? The fuyu and the hachia. How do you research this stuff? Do you go just like into searching things on the internet or do you get empirical with your taste testing? How do you set this up? A little bit of both. So my big mistake, my first time when I, when I suffered terribly, was that I didn't know that there were two different kinds. So when I went to the store and got the hot chip because I thought they looked good. Mm -hmm. If they're not labeled, hot chip is like sort of shaped like an acorn, like a big plump acorn. Whereas uh, fuyu is shaped more like a tomato. So if it's a tomato shape, that's a fuyu. If it's an acorn shape, it's, that's a hot chip. The quick difference is that fuyu can be eaten basically whenever. It's like a plum, you know, a slightly unripe plum will be fine. I actually think an, a slightly unripe fuyu will be better than an unripe plum, which is quite sour. But um, you do want to get it when it's a little soft because that's going to get ma that maximum juiciness. But a fuyu persimmon does not have what's called the astringent factor. The astringent factor is caused by tannins in hachia persimmons, which slowly disappear as the hachia ripens. The tannins are what cause that horrible, horrible chalk mouth feel. And if you eat enough of it, you can, it'll also cause a, an upset stomach. Wow. Um, your body doesn't want to consume those. But as a uh, hachia ripens, and it ripens from tip down to where the stem is, the tannins disperse or dissolve, or I'm not a scientist, I don't know what happens, they go away. And suddenly what you're left with is this delicious custard-like kind of mango-y, sweet, nutty fruit. I say custard-like because when a hachia persimmon is ripe, you can eat it with a spoon. You cut it in half and you have the two halves and you get a spoon and you spoon out the meat, which is at that point, as I've said, custard-like. So I only found that out after I had the horrible first experience with the hachia and I was like, what the fuck? What, what happened? And I consulted the internet and the internet was like, aha! This is what happened. In fact, if you Google persimmon, the first thing that'll pop up is like weird taste because I am not the only one. I've joked that stores should really put a warning label like, do not eat this when you think you should eat it. Because the irony is that when a hot chip persimmon looks most beautiful is when it is not to be eaten. You really want to wait until it like basically looks like it's bruised and rotten or not rotten, but overripe. Like if you saw this store, you'd be like, I'm not buying that. That's actually when you want to buy it. That's the, that's the irony of the thing. Right. Or you keep it in your kitchen on the counter until it gets to that point. And it's a real object lesson in patience. <laughs> Absolutely. A lesson in patience. But that does bring us to our empirical exercise. Because now that I've bought so many of them, I'm more willing to experiment to be like, okay, I suspect this one is right. Let me find out if it's a little, you know, if I get a, a little edge of astringent, it's not the end of the world. And that's helped me actually get a greater sensitivity to when they're ripe or not. So I'm going to try to describe this. If you pick it up, if you pick up a hacha persimmon and it feels very solid, like it's all moving with you at once, it's not ripe yet. But if you pick it up and you feel a little give in your fingers and almost like it's heavier, like you're having to pull up the skin and the juice all together, mm -hmm. then it's probably ready. Can't explain why that feeling is different, but I've done it enough times now that my fingers can sense when it's there. And that's helped me land right on that, like not too gooey and overripe, although that is its own delicious experience, but then not astringent either. 
And so do you have a preference? Do you like the marmalade, like overripe hachia, or do you like the fuyu, or are you about sort of tasting the rainbow, the entire spectrum of the persimmon experience? I am all about the entire spectrum of the persimmon experience, but I will say lately, and maybe it's because I like the challenge of it or like the, the finesse of it. There's something about nailing the hachia right on its like peak ripe but not over ripeness that's like really doing it for me right now it's it's the the timeliness of it fuyu is delicious but almost seems too easy at this point like okay yeah even it's delicious crazy and i do think that a ripe hachia is tastier than a ripe fuyu they're bigger they're fleshier it's like a more satisfying sort of eating experience and then there's, there is that satisfaction of patience, of being rewarded for waiting, which is, you know, a human experience since time immemorial. Yeah, I got a bag of for you myself as part of research for this podcast. I think it was worth the effort to give persimmons another try because they were pretty common when I lived in Japan. I r- actually preferred the dried ones, the hoshigaki, which are kind of expensive and h- hard to get, but very good, like a dried apricot, but a little bit firmer and leatherier, but in a good way. Yeah, I think giving them another chance and also knowing about the tannin thing now, it's like, okay, I know not to eat them when they're underripe and waiting for that marmalade effect, I think is totally worth it. It's pretty magical. But remember, your fuyus don't need to be in marmalade. It's the hachia that needs to be marmalade. Your fuyu will be like, different degrees of delightful at various stages of ripeness, like a more standard fruit, like, like an apricot or a, a peach. But uh, for your next shipment, get the hachia and then embrace the uncertainty. Embrace the, when you play the game of persimmons, you either get delicious or death. Embrace the risk, embrace not knowing. And then by doing so, come closer to knowing. Mm. That reminds me of shishito peppers as well, those Japanese green uh-huh. peppers that are usually very mild and, you know, I just like them lightly fried and salted. But sometimes you'll get a really spicy one. And I think it's that kind of mischief of the shishito <laughs> pepper that makes it so interesting, right? Otherwise, it's like, okay, it's just a thin skinned green pepper kind of thing. But it's the fact that you might accidentally get one that really gets you back that it's like, oh, I respect you. And I appreciate that mischief. I see that. But you know, that's more like Russian roulette. That luck of the draw. There's nothing that you as a cooker or eater of shishito peppers can do to determine whether or not it's the random hot one or not. However, with persimmons, with hot chip persimmons, it's a strategy game. Like you're taking in the input. There are certain things you can do. The easiest trick is that if you can easily pull the sort of round leafy top off, if it comes right out, it's ripe. Although there was one, there was one where it did that and it was not ripe yet. I got the delicious taste and then you know, it was a bitter, bitter, bitter moment. I still ate the whole thing, but I suffered through it. Pleasure and pain and persimmons. So the first thing, you know, if you can lift the green off. But then there's like, there's all those things, like I told you about, like with the, the hand feel, the weight of it, how much you can push your fingers in. You're taking in all of this empirical data about the thing that's in front of you. And then you're making a choice. Mm-hmm. Am I going to eat it right now or not? And you know that the moment you cut into it, you've committed. That persimmon is gone. You know, if it's not ripe, you have to throw it out. It's truly inedible, unless it's someone in that middle ground where it's like, ah, it's edible. And then I get this like kick at the end and I don't like it. And it's not great. You probably shouldn't eat those. But it's commitment. You have to commit to your choice. There's no walking back from it. So in that sense, it's more like crossing the Rubicon. (laughs) <laughs> or to use another Julius Caesar kind of reference, like Alia Yachta est, except it'd be, uh, uh, is my Latin, do I remember to cut? <laughs> the only thing to say should be persimmon corta est, secta, because sectum sempra in Harry Potter. So Latin nerds, don't quote me on this, but persimmon secta est. There we go. <laughs> so is there 
anything you can do, like you cut into it and it's astringent, like can you like cook it, turn it into jam or anything, or you just decide to suffer through it or just throw it out? Not as far as I know. Consult the persimmon expert. I am a mere novice in the deep art of the persimmon. My assumption is that there's nothing you can do because once you cut it open, it's going to stop ripening. And that's the problem. And I don't think cooking it changes the tannin. Again, consult the internet, consult the experts, consult the wise persimmon masters atop mountains who might have better solutions for you, but I wouldn't know what to do. (laughs) Right. So before we explore these other themes of obsession and devotion and patience that you've shown to the persimmon in other aspects of your work, final persimmon question. Did you watch that 20-minute persimmon video that I sent to you from that Chinese YouTuber? I knew you were going to ask, and I confess that I did not. I will have to watch it. So for you and for our listeners, it's this 20-minute video from this Chinese YouTuber named Li Ziqi, and she's this 30-year-old, 29-year-old Chinese young woman who does essentially like slow TV. And this 20-minute video has like footage that's probably takes place over two years. And it centers around persimmon, but it's not just persimmon. So she lives on this farm in rural China, and it starts with her like picking persimmon from the persimmon tree, but perfectly made up with very expensive camera equipment. And it goes through all of the things that she does with the persimmon. Like she ferments it into persimmon vinegar that's later used as like a dipping sauce for this barbecue they have at the end of the video. She makes her own dried persimmon. It's very, very involved and very relaxing, but also just super intense because it's it culminates in a meal that's two years nearly in the making. Wow. That's something that only cinema can do is collapse time in that way. It makes me think of Richard Linklater and his various experiments on time and cinema and storytelling. Although, and this is actually relevant to Persimmon, Linklater's grand theme throughout almost all of his work is now, 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 now. There's the line in Days and Confused, which I'm sure I'm going to butcher much to my family's chagrin. I want to stop looking at the present as some insignificant preamble to something else. But then Linklater looks at, in the same movies that he has these ideas of now, he will do boyhood and it's, you know, 12 years, collapse. Or if you watch all the before trilogy in one day, you're getting these three different moments, seven years apart, all collapsed into one day. And this relates to persimmon because, like I said, the decision to cut and eat a persimmon is all about now. There is is no future, no past. There is just the moment of the decision to cut open the persimmon. So I think there is something existentially linklater s in the persimmon. Unless you dry the persimmon or turn it into persimmon vinegar, right? But I get your point about the... (laughs) (laughs) Leave me with my metaphors. Wait, one last thought on the persimmon. I think what other fruit is so time sensitive? Like it's so like the waiting, the waiting, the waiting now. That's what I mean with regard to relationship of the persimmon to time. In fact... The other night, I thought there was a disaster because I accidentally knocked over my menorah. Happy Hanukkah, everyone. Um, This was not with the candles in it, thank God. And it landed on one of my persimmons that was, I wasn't sure if it was ripe or not. And it opened it. And so I thought to myself, "Uh uh-oh, well, I hope it's ripe because the menorah made the decision for me. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, I sliced it. It was perfect. So whether by our own hands or by the figurative hand of God or menorah, the persimmon is opened at the moment that it is open and the moment is there or it is not time the fruit time the fruit and it's peak season now right you can only get fresh persimmons in the fall through early winter so exactly there some. truly is a timeliness about it you know there's logos pathos ethos that we learn about in school but there's also kairos which is the timeliness of a thing the nowness of it yeah. An appeal to the noun. It also reminds me of that there's a Japanese expression, ichigo ichie, which is one time, one meeting. But it's basically mm-hmm. like the, the Zen version of Eminem, you've only got one shot, right? This moment only comes once in a lifetime. I'll see that and I'll raise you, <laughs> Yugen, from the Japanese no, and also other Japanese art forms 
which is the idea of the perfection of doing something in exactly the moment and time that it should happen. Now, in the Japanese, no, that might be the unfolding of a, of a fan or a particular gesture or the turn of the hand or a, a tilt of the face. It's compared to like the falling of, um, you know, a blossom. I took two Japanese theater courses way back when. So it's all buried back somewhere. Interesting, though, that the persimmon is a distinctly Japanese fruit. So although it does grow wild here in America as well. Hmm. No conclusion on that front, except that the Japanese seem extra sensitive to the art of time. Easy cook bear. So back to the art of time in cinema, you have some thoughts on Linklater and you recently watched the Before Trilogy all in one day, right? How was that experience? Because I've seen them, but not consecutively all in one sitting. It was extraordinary. This was actually in February because it was Valentine's Day and <laughs> I did not have a Valentine. So I took myself to BAM to watch all three movies in one day. And I hadn't seen any of them before, much to, to my own dismay. So I, I figured I will mainline them all in one day. And it's really moving. I mean, they're so young at the beginning. Yeah. It's not that they're so old by the end, but just the questions. In each one of them, they're dogged by really big questions, questions that are big enough to fill who they are at that moment. But the questions that dog them in Before Sunrise seem so much smaller than the ones uh, Before Midnight. And in retrospect, like Before Sunrise just seems so hopelessly romantic and naive as a wandering Vienna. To experience it all in one day was just very moving. It feels like time accordions and it's, it's an experience. And I think that's something that as a filmmaker, I'm only beginning to really grapple with is what is the experience of film as distinct from story, perhaps? Yeah. Because obviously the Before Trilogy has story, but it's also sort of deliberately anti-story. There are certain questions. How's the night going to go? How's the day going to go? You know, how, how's this marriage going to go? But otherwise, there's not, a, and there is a ticking clock, but there isn't a, this happens and then this happens and this happens in the traditional story mode. So it's much more experiential. And to watch all three of them in one day is a guttural experience of, of time and its passage and our growth, which I connect to my experience of boyhood, which first I saw just on my own, and then I saw with my family, all four of us, and we're from Central Texas, which is where Boyhood was shot and where Linklater set much of his, many of his movies. And so to see this kid growing up so quickly before our eyes in, in Central Texas, and even to see people I knew from the Austin theater scene at various moments, and then to see them four years apart, was its own kind of profound and powerful experience. I know some of the criticism of Boyhood is that it doesn't have proper narrative or doesn't properly look into its own characters and, and their, uh, their motivations and their thoughts, et cetera. But I think that's sort of missing the point. Like the point is the experience. The point is cinema's ability to almost as a montage of home videos, you know, yeah. splice and capture moments and moments and moments and moments moments of consequence and moments of no consequence and moments that another movie would make consequential that are not here. Like the kids throwing the saw blades at the wall. Like we're, we as audience members are trained to think, oh my God, something's going to happen. That's horrible. But no, kids do dumb shit all the time. And oftentimes nothing happens and sometimes things do. And then the bigger eventful things sometimes are caught on screen. And sometimes next time we meet the family, that dad is gone, you know? Right. So the experience of cinema is something that I'm still getting my head around. So this idea of moments, it reminds me of something that a rapper named Nesby Phipps told me. I met him when I was doing some work in New Orleans years ago, and he talked about his work and what he does as being an author of moments. So both in terms of his songwriting, but also just how he goes about the world and creating these moments. And obviously he created one with me because I'm quoting him five, six years later. 
How do you think about creating moments in your own work? Because your films so far have been short films. And so they Mm -hmm. have been revolving around moments. And so whether it's with your first short film and this moment of this couple or the the more scatological moments of your second film or this also moment in time of this kid and his dying uncle in your most recent works. But how do you connect those together in this through line around moments, I wonder? I mean, I think it's easiest to talk about this with regards to the most recent short film, Last Summer with Uncle Ira, because the way that I kind of pitched it to myself in my head was, a moment to last a lifetime. Mm. So the premise of Last Summer with Uncle Ira, which is inspired by my uncle who died of AIDS when I was three, and it's my sort of imagining, what would it have been like if I had been 16 in the summer of 1991 and had a chance to know him, Mm. uh, had a relationship with him, as opposed to what my reality is, which is that he died when I was three and I grew up with his specter, but not with his real self. Mm -hmm. So the premise of the short, which I wanted to be very, very minimal, very, very small, is that our main kid, Daniel, is about to go to summer camp and he's going to be gone for eight weeks and his uncle, who is home, will probably be dead Mm -hmm. by the time he gets back. And the uncle, who knows who his nephew is, along with the kid's mom, played by Tony when our Stephanie J. Block. (laughs) <laughs> they both know who who the kid is, perhaps better than he knows himself. And they know that it would be good for a conversation to happen if the kid is ready to have it. Yeah. So the mom nudges the kid out the door, says, make lemonade for your uncle and go talk to him. And then the kid sits down to talk with the uncle and they can't talk about the thing the uncle tries to create space for the, for the nephew to um, share something of himself. And that does happen. It just happens in very cloaked language, all about summer camp, the same summer camp that they both went to and certain questions of what it means to be brave, to take plunges, etc. And then also in the perhaps most important moment when the uncle says, if there's anything you want to talk to me about, any questions that need answering, you, you know, I'm here for you. You can write it down if it's easier. Lick it and stamp it and send it, but do it soon. Mm-hmm. And that's where we get to the, the, the timeliness of it, which is that the simple reality is that time is running out for this conversation to happen. And if that conversation is not now, it will never be. Now, because in my life, I never got to have that conversation with my uncle. It doesn't happen. The kid doesn't come out. He's not ready. He can't be ready. He's 16. You know, he's still figuring this out for himself. Yeah. Um, He's a Hachi, a persimmon, not yet ripe. Yes. Yes. But what the Hachi, a persimmon, which is ripe, is a moment of recognition where Daniel, the kid, takes Ira, the uncle's hand, and we see the lesion, the KS lesion that's right there on his wrist, and he takes his hand, and in this kind of gesture of reverence lowers his forehead to the uncle's hand and then looks up at him with just love and sadness and grief in his eyes. And it's a wonderful performance from Igby Rickney, who plays the kid. And it's a wonderful response from Wayne Wilcox, who plays the uncle. And when we talk about moments, that's the moment we spend 10 minutes-ish revving up slow burn to this moment where the kid takes his uncle's hand and loves him and reveres him. And the uncle gives that love back. And it's totally silent except for the uncle saying, and here we are to the persimmon again, in your own time, Mm. in your own time. And uh, that's, (laughs) that's what it's all about, man. (laughs) Like that for me, that's what story exists for is to build to a moment where perhaps not the exact thing can be said, but something can be said and some gesture can happen that can shift the world off its axis, or at least for these two people, or maybe for an audience member. That's the goal anyway. Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking about. I think that's very Japanese as well, this aesthetic of (laughs) a moment that's poignant in sometimes absence 
I think this is also my mind space since we've been watching these Ozu films together as well recently. Another deep dive that we've done in 2020 is the, the Ozu dive. Yeah. Go on. But in particular, late spring, part of Ozu's famous Noriko trilogy, right? Where Noriko, the main character, is about to leave for her wedding. She's all done up in her traditional kimono. And then we don't even see the wedding, even though the whole the whole movie is built around getting Noriko to marry. And then it just goes and cuts to her father in the bar and dealing with that. But it's in some ways we don't need to see the wedding. I think if it were like a Hollywood thing, like that's your dramatic scene, right? And that's your big budget wedding scene. But for Ozu, it doesn't really matter. It's more about the human experience and the feeling of now the daughter is gone. She's out of the house. And so that was my connection I saw the cut of your film, the the Ira film, before we watched Late Spring, I believe. And so now that we're revisiting both, I'm kind of making that connection. Absolutely. I think, and especially like that final moment between father and daughter is a gesture. That's a gesture. That's a gesture of extraordinary power. And that goes back to the Japanese theater stuff that we were talking about, because The whole idea of the traditional no play, uh, which has largely inspired a lot of my writing projects, including plays and to a certain extent movies, is that there's often an unsettled ghost, which through the power of gesture, oftentimes a a monk traveling with his prayer beads, through the power of gesture, or even just the ability of the ghost to go through the motions of these ritual-esque dances, to be resolved or not, to be set at ease or not, to be returned to the heavens or not. And the stakes are often very high, but the actions themselves that lead to the conclusion or lack thereof tend to be quite minimal, as if to say that there's just something about doing the gesture in the space, in the time that has that power. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, and especially once you connect that to the yugen of it, of the doing it at that time, at the exact right time. And even um, there's another concept out of the Japanese no theater, which is imono, uh, which is essentially the the object that a no performer holds, like a fan, or sometimes it's a branch, that like if a lightning rod draws the spirit into our real space, like what is the object? What is the gesture? What is the moment that draws kind of the cosmic thing into this very... uh, tangible physical moment in last summer with uncle ira perhaps it's it's the lemonade Mm -hmm. in fact because uh in the final moment ira takes a drink a swig of the lemonade starts choking and coughing and that's what prompts daniel to take his hand um to comfort him you know there's nothing more bland than a glass of lemonade well at least on a sort of (laughs) humdrum american way ideally a glass of lemonade is not bland to the the taste since this is a food podcast but that's the thing that like draws the cosmic into the physical as a designer it has me thinking a lot about as you were saying what was that term again from the no about the object torimono yeah the torimono the that object being a stand-in i think prop is really kind of underselling it but for some deeper theme of the human experience, right? So the lemonade, choking on the lemonade is a kind of foreshadowing of of death, right? For Ira or what we've talked about before of like nothingness, right? They don't have the conversation, but they have this realization or an understanding, even if it's unsaid. And I think that use of the negative space in the narrative is really powerful, right? And going back to Ozu, just to connect the dots, on his gravestone, it's just the single character Mu, which is like nothingness or without, which is a, a Zen Buddhist term. Yeah, it seems super pretentious to be like, oh, it's, it's a lot about nothing, but there is a lot in nothing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> nothing gives contours to the something, he said, pretending to be deep. <laughs> <laughs> If we return to the more concrete and the food focused, and we can connect these dots as we go, you mentioned growing up in Texas, your family is Mm -hmm. Jewish with New York roots, and now you're back in New York. But can you talk about your culinary heritage or how would you define that in terms of what you grew up with and 
what's shaped you in terms of food and cooking? Yeah. Well, I think the most important food influence is probably just my mom, who Mm -hmm. cooked most nights that she wasn't on business trips. And she tended to cook kind of what I'll call like robust, healthy food. It uh, has a lot of vegetables and like a lot of grilled meat. And I think that set my tongue to a distaste for extremely rich and sugary things just because did not grow up with it. Yeah. Um, Anytime I see someone like, dumping sugar into an already sugary like Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts beverage, I go inside. Like I just, I cannot do it. Uh, And to that point, quite similarly, my dad taught me to drink coffee black and whiskey neat. Uh, So so sometimes, you know, I'll try a, a whiskey drink or something and I'm like, but why is there stuff in it? Why did I pay more money for them to mess with it? What if it were just whiskey? So I think that sort of robust, Healthy, but never austere, uh, never severe in its limitations. Like there's always enough food on the table. There's always good food, good flavors served well. So, mm-hmm. so I think that's the home environment. But I did grow up in Texas, which means that I have very high expectations for Tex-Mex in particular. I used to have a rule that I don't go to Mexican food if it wasn't in a state that was formerly part of Mexico, but I've actually amended that to, I don't go to Tex-Mex, really outside of Texas, because Tex-Mex is that funny food, which is really, really, really delicious in Texas mm-hmm. and is junk elsewhere, because only in Texas do you really know how to make the junk delicious. Like, <laughs> it's not just put cheese on it. It's like other shit too. So I grew up with that. I grew up with barbecue, obviously, and I grew up with spicy food. So I, I do really appreciate interest. Um, and whenever Blue Apron asks me to put in as much spice as I want, I always put in all of it. And I, I enjoy when the shishito peppers are Russian roulette spicy. So. And so how does that inform how you cook for yourself now since you live alone and you cook HelloFresh, but... Do you cook your own original recipes as well, or is it mostly kind of programmed by HelloFresh? It's interesting you should bring up HelloFresh, which I tried, but ultimately went back to Blue Apron Mm. on. Because what I felt the difference was, was that HelloFresh delivered sort of blandly fatty, satisfying meals, which I enjoyed, but there was something not as interesting about them. Whereas Blue Apron will do much more interesting flavor profiles and they'll kind of do interesting fusions of sauces. And that's just to my preference. I also feel like there's a little bit more of an education going on because the benefit of doing a food box service is that you sort of slowly passively acquire not expertise, but at least a sense of, oh, these two things go together. Right. Typically when, when I cook, it asks me to do this and then that so that it just is logging in there, which then shows up when I do try to cook my own stuff. I will say that I don't have the expertise to really come up with a good recipe on my own. I do like following a recipe. I tend, when I do uh, that, I tend to either find something on the internet or I like to dig into my mom and my grandmother's Jewish food recipes. At this point, I am quite good at matzo ball soup and my grandmother's brisket. And I really nailed the latkes this year. I made them for my neighbors who I've gotten friendly with because of COVID. You know, we just gather on the roof. And they were like, this is, this is the best latkes I've ever had. Although then it came out that her family made them from a box. So the competition was not, <laughs> was not intense. But um, some people make very sort of sculpted, aesthetically lovely latkes. And the way that my mom taught me is, you know, they should be hairy and homemade. Like shred it. They, they should feel like shredded potatoes that have been mixed with shredded onions, chopped onions that... And then put in oil, you know, and uh, that's how they came out. And I would say that, you know, my instincts on what they should be are strong enough now that I could figure out, oh, more seasoning, oh, not enough seasoning, oh, more time, oh, not enough time, so and so forth. But you can improvise. I've seen it happen in front of my eyes. You have a real uh, craftsman's ability to uh, pull things together that you know are going to work. And I... Do not have that. I aspire to have that in the fullness of time, like the persimmon. Well, since you brought up latkes, the other day I was actually thinking about that since 
we're not gathering right now. It's like, oh, I don't have the experience of going to a Jewish friend's house and having homemade latkes. And so I had some potatoes at home and some other vegetables. And I had this realization that latkes and this Japanese dish called kakiage are kind of like cousins, kissing cousins from different continents in a way. And kakiage is basically julienne strips of vegetables. So I also don't currently own a grater. So I hand julienne the potatoes. I also had some carrots and some scallions. And traditionally, it's batter fried, sort of like a tempura. Um, and sometimes you put like seafood in it, although this time I just made it vegetarian. But it came out kind of like a latke. It's basically there was some potato starch in it to bind it together in water. And then you just also fry it in some oil. Mm -hmm. And it was really good, but it was totally improvised with this understanding of like, okay, latkes are this and kakiage is that, and this is what I have in the fridge. And so this is what's happening on the stove. That sounds similar to how I feel about writing right now, which is that I would train as a theater director. And then I decided I actually really wanted to be a writer about five to six years ago. And I said, okay, well, then I guess I really have to start from scratch. Now, I wasn't really starting from scratch because I, I had a, a long history of directing theater, which is being involved in story. But as far as the sitting down and writing a, a screenplay or a play or whatever, I did have to go back to the book. So for those first couple of years, I really followed the formula and read the book and tried to execute what I was reading in the book. And what I've been feeling now in the last year or two, really for the first time, is an ability to do essentially what you're doing in the kitchen, mm -hmm. which is to see, oh, what, I, what my goal is, is this. And that's kind of similar to that. So I'm going to employ this and that's going to fulfill that rule. But I'm also going to pepper in a, a little bit of that because I think that that would expand it or release it or give it that extra interest. Yeah. And I'm by no means a master, but I feel like I'm enough along the way of my you want to call them the 10,000 hours or enough along the way in my craft that instead of just sort of looking straight at the recipe, which is what I do with the chef right now, I'm able to improvise a little bit with the recipes or, or listen to the story and hear, okay, if there are 10 rules, follow these eight and break those two, which is just an exciting place to be. And uh, I've been the lucky recipient of the product of your kitchen. So if I get to ever create for others the delight that you create in your cooking, for me, then uh, I'll know that I'll have uh, arrived. <laughs> I think you've brought many people delight in your work that's screened in festivals and other places around the world. Well, thank you. A big achievement recently was that Next Level Shit, my second short film, played on the Scruff app for a week. And I just had to laugh at that because in 2016, when I made my first short film, if I had said to myself, P.S., your second short film is going to be a scatological gay rom-com, which will ultimately screen for a week on a gay sex app, I'd be like, hmm, what? <laughs> and, and now she's like, oh yeah, sex level shit was on Scruff for 10 days. How fun. Moving on. <laughs> I don't know. Time. Time is funny. We keep coming back to time tonight, which makes sense. And also this unexpected achievement, right? Especially now that the traditional cinemas are closed, gay hookup apps are kind of a, a movie theater of sorts, or right? they are a distribution medium of sorts. And so how do you think about that in terms of your craft? Like, obviously, you've done the festival circuit, your stuff looks great on a big screen, but also knowing that people are going to be watching your stuff on a small screen and not in the theatrical experience. Does that change the way that you write and think about film? Honestly, it doesn't. Partially because I just haven't had the opportunity for it to have changed the way I thought. We filmed last summer with Uncle Lyra in September 2019. By the time it hit the festival circuit, everything was remote. So I've never seen it on a big screen. My sister has. There was a drive-in screening at Outfest in Los Angeles, and she drove out. So the only person in my family who's seen the movie on the big screen is my sister. But this moment will end, and there will be appetite for in-person, on-the-big-screen experiences. Maybe not in the traditional mode, but the general thinking is that if the AMCs and the Regals of the world 
suffer, it'll be to the benefit of the Alamo draft houses and of the film festival experience, of a real sense of going for an experience, not just going for a movie. That's the general thought. But at the end of the day, for me, I think story is story. And you should deliver an experience that looks great on a big screen and feels great on a small screen. And if you haven't, then you might want to <laughs> you might want to work on your story a little bit more. OK, here's my example. Titanic. Titanic is amazing on the big screen and it's amazing on a small screen. And I bet if you watch Titanic on your phone, it'd be pretty great, too. Why? <laughs> because Titanic is a great movie. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to be the type that poo poos something for being popular. My best friends from high school and I have watched a movie every Friday night this whole year and Titanic was one of them. So I've, I've watched it recently. That shit holds up, though the ship itself sinks, of course. I don't think I've seen it for over 20 years since it came out originally. Watch it again. Like it's, I mean, you can look at it from a craft perspective on so many different levels. And it's just like a, a viscerally satisfying, fucking awesome experience. Three hours that go by like it's an hour and a half. It's a romance and a horror film. It's kind of uniquely something that James Cameron can deliver. And I, I'm not being ironic about this. Like t Titanic is great. So that's a good example of something that uh, no matter what the size is that you experience it, it's still going to be a satisfying experience. Whereas some other products that really like, oh, well, it's only good if you see it on the big screen, then something's wrong with it. I, I don't have much else to say besides that, except story first, as ever, as always. But which then I suppose connects back to the question of experience, which we were talking about sort of as distinctive story but maybe they don't have to be distinct. Maybe the story of boyhood is you're going to watch a kid grow up now. And that's all the story you need to create the experience that's satisfying. I don't know. These things are bigger than me. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for us to turn the tables and flip the script where you get to ask me anything. Mm. Okay. So since we've talked so much about time and food and the poetic, <laughs> the poetic aspect of time and when things happen and how they happen in time, when you think of food, what is the single timeliest food that you can think of, whether that's when in the year to make it or when in the cooking something has to happen? What is the food most associated with time for you and why? Wow, that's actually easy for me to answer. And that is traditional edomae sushi. So like traditional sushi, like I love like California rolls and all of these American rolls, but I mean like basically a piece of fish on rice. And a few years ago, I had the opportunity to eat at Jiro's in Tokyo and it's just so intimate. Right. The fact that the fish was fresh from the market that morning and mm -hmm. it's the closest thing to having a sushi chef feed you, hand feed you <laughs> in a sort of like mama penguin kind of way. Like not literally that, obviously, but it's like you literally feel the warmth of the rice that had just left their hand. Well, it's and fish, it's like so it's not in that far from a mama penguin. Yeah. But I think there's something about that, right? It's like the fish has to be fresh when it's done right, like the rice is still warm. And so it's, it's a timely moment. Like you just have to eat it within seconds. You're not dallying about, especially with the chef staring at you and observing every facial expression you make while you eat your sushi. But there's something so immediate about that and so intimate about that. Well, since you and I are theoretically planning a trip to, a trip to Japan at some point, I guess we'll have to put that on the list. Yeah. Uh, how much money do I need to set aside for that dinner? <laughs> joke, joking, tell me after the <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell the you after the podcast. <laughs> but, you know, you're already going to Japan, so it's just one of those yeah. once-in-a-lifetime things. You know, I'm not very good at splurging on myself. So that's, that's one of these things that I've sort of put in my head as far as when the pandemic is done, I'm going to fucking go to Japan. And I'm not, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to spend money. Yeah on myself. It's that's a weird thing to say out loud because historically when I spend money on something, it's like, I'm going to make a short film because that's going to help my career. And it's because it's an expression of the art, but it's still fundamentally work. 
like my 30th birthday presents myself with making next level shit, which I joked was like a very stressful three day birthday party. And, <laughs> but this will have no benefits other than pure enjoyment. And God damn it, it's December 2020 and I've earned it. <laughs> totally. And you can treat it as pure enjoyment and self-care, whatever you want. But I think as creative people and creative professionals, it's also giving yourself an experience to draw upon, even if you don't make a movie about sushi, right? But it's something about crafting moments or experiencing some part of the human experience that you tuck away for later. Right. And you know, that's been one of the very interesting things to emerge almost accidentally this year is the realization that for whatever reason, Japan has always been like a sleeper important influence in my life. Mm -hmm. In college, I directed this Paula Vogel play called The Long Christmas Ride Home, which is sort of an American Thornton Wilder one-act tradition fused with bunraku puppetry. I built these three bunraku style children in my, in my <laughs> parents' garage over the summer. I brought them to New Haven. They lived on my couch. I did not get any action that semester because I had these three <laughs> children on, on my couch. Uh, so there was that. I took these as a sort of a result of that. I took these two uh, Japanese theater courses, which really profoundly influenced my thinking about story and gesture and experience. And then just this year, sort of accidentally, you and I started watching Ozu because I was doing what I called the Criterion Crunch, where I had gotten the Criterion channel for two weeks and wanted to watch a different Criterion movie every night. I asked you what you wanted to watch. You said Ozu's Tokyo Story. So that started that. Meanwhile, my cousin Sarah and I were talking about Miyazaki, and it came out that I had only seen Spirited Away and Ponyo. And she was like, what? You need to watch more of them. Now, my number one artist of the year <laughs> on Spotify is Joe Hisaishi. And apparently I'm in the top 0.05% <laughs> of Joe Hisaishi listeners. So there, there's that. There's the persimmon, <laughs> like as a, as a Japanese thing. I, I don't know, man. I wouldn't have ever said out loud, like, oh, well, when I look at my influences, like Japan, sometimes you don't know until it's staring at you right in the face and keeps on articulating itself, which is very interesting. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Japanese food? I know that's a tough question. I'm not going to call it a food. I will call it an experience, Okay. which was my 25th birthday. This is actually quite similar, except probably not, not quite as intensely rarefied. But for my 25th birthday, my parents took me to Uchiko in North Austin, it's a quite influential chef who runs two businesses in Austin, Uchiko and Uchi. He won Top Chef, I want to say. Anyway. Uh, Paul, Paul Kui? Paul Key? Key. That sounds right. Yeah. But yes, that's it. So I had never been, and these are Austin establishments, like, you know, representative of the new Austin excitement that was happening, but had also been around long enough to still feel like, not just like, what the fuck is this, that a lot of new Austin is. And so it was my 25th birthday and we walked in and we did my favorite thing, which is we just said, bring us food. There's a name for that style of ordering, which I'm sure you know, which I can't think of right now. Omakase, which there you means go. like, yeah, I honorably <laughs> defer to you. Well, that's my favorite way to eat is that I like everything. There's nothing that I don't like. So I always ask a waiter, what would you recommend? I just want the most thoroughly that place experience if I'm going to be there. And what do you know? They brought us food. They brought us such delicious things over the course of that time. They brought us slices of sake. They brought us jars with slices of beef on hot rocks. They brought us wonderfully tasty, fresh sushi. They, they brought us fantastic manipulations of quail egg and uni and... <laughs> you know, dazzling creation. And um, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> it's clearly made an impression since this was over five years ago and you remember these details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that sort of goes back to, I think, your question about my culinary background, which is my family's motto is everything in moderation, including moderation, which is mostly, you know, mom would cook and cook relatively healthy at home, good food, good ingredients not too excessive. 
And then sometimes, sometimes you just got to flip the excess button. But then again, this was like very classy excess. <laughs> yeah. And I joke that when you eat Japanese food, you have the magic compartment in your stomach. Korean food too, where like you can just eat a lot more <laughs> because totally. there's something about the way it's prepared or maybe it's the time in which it comes out that you can just keep eating. So. For sure. Yeah, there's a phrase in Japanese, bitsubara, which means like second stomach basically. And it's like, oh, well, do you have room for dessert? Yeah, bitsubara. You know, it's a second stomach for that because it's, it's a separate taste. Uh, I want it. I want all of it. I mean, I also just want to go to a restaurant and experience that <laughs> in the future. Indeed. Easy cook bear. Well, now we've reached our lightning round. So we have a few oh. short questions to take us out. Oh my. So first of all, do you have an easy cook recipe that you can share with our listeners or something that's like in your heavy rotation? Okay. Matzo ball soup. You ready? Okay. Basically, this is just chicken soup, but we can throw the matzo balls in too. We'll start with the chicken soup. It's very easy. You start with a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> you, you take all the fat off of it. Then into your pot, you start with the onion, and the onions go in for a bit. Then in goes the celery and the carrot. And this is called a mirepoix. Am I getting that right? Yeah, mirepoix, yeah. And it's this magic chemistry of onion times celery times carrot equals delicious broth thing, which gets even more delicious when you put the chicken in. And that's just going to sit for a while. Gary messaged me after our interview to clarify that the correct order into the pot is first the onions, then the previously defatted chicken, and then finally the carrot and celery. Now, you might have been asking, why did I pull the fat off? Good question. I pulled the fat off so that I could render the fat into schmaltz. That just means, for those who don't know, put it in a little pot, heat it up, and reduce it to a liquid form, which has the added benefit of creating chicharrones, um, mm. the skin that's been now fried in the fat. And then you've got the liquid fat form, which is your schmaltz. What are we going to do with that schmaltz, you ask? Well, when you get your sort of standard-ass matzo ball mix, from the cabinet, it's going to say, put in oil for your fat. Don't use oil, use the schmaltz. Uh, it's going to be great. So you follow the instructions on the ball mix packet. Sorry, that's not very exciting, but yeah, you know. Yeah, we're keeping this easy cook and you started with the chicken so you can cut some corners with the actual matzo balls. Right. At least I'm not doing matzo ball soup mix. That would be terrible. So, you know, at a certain point, the chicken can come out of the soup and then I like to slice it so that I can serve it back in the soup when it's time um, and then the big chunks I set aside to either just eat later on my own or this, it's usually around Passover that I'm making this so I've got horseradish so like horseradish added to the slightly bland soup chicken is like very tasty mm -hmm. then basically you're done like add as much salt as you need <laughs> <laughs> chicken soup done awesome it's just for something that's so delicious and a good chicken soup has like a lot of dimensions of flavor in it, mm -hmm. it's crazy how simple it is. Onion, celery, carrot, chicken, water, salt, pepper, that's it. Time. <laughs> Magical. And we've already been talking about what you've been listening to in terms of Joe Hisaishi and Ozu and these other things. So I'll ask you what you're reading right now and what would you recommend our listeners read? Great question. This is relevant to the deep dive of 2020. Over the summer, I read a lot of Ursula K. Le Guin's science fiction, including her two masterpieces, The Left Hand of Darkness and The Dispossessed. And then I made a mental note that I wanted to explore her fantasy stuff. So I recently acquired this beautiful volume of the Books of Earthsea, illustrated, hardbound, just gorgeous. And I've been reading that. I'm, I'm only on the first one, but I'm enjoying it very much. It's literary, but it's, you know, wizards and dragons and boats. Great. I'm finding it a really perfect COVID winter reading vibe because I'm not thinking about it too much, but it's not pulp. Yeah. And because it's Le Guin, because it's this, the mastermind of 
deep probing incisive works like left hand of darkness just sort of aims slightly lower mm-hmm. you get the robust feeling of substance and and things to think about while also having fun with said wizards and dragons and both tales of earthly that's that's my recommendation awesome final question where can folks find you online Oh boy. Don't look at my website that I haven't updated since 2012 and really need to fix because that's embarrassing. But you can find me on Instagram at Gary S, as in Scott Jaffe, Gary S. Jaffe. It's a combination of writer selfies and the occasional thirst trap, which I'm only partially ashamed of. And then you can also find me on Twitter at Gary Jaffe, which is mostly movie stuff and X Twitter. I mostly comment enthusiastically about what's going on in the X-Men comics right now, because that's something we haven't even talked about. <laughs> and uh, at some point, I'll have a website. It will be GaryJaffe.com. I have the domain. It doesn't exist yet, but for posterity, that's where you can find me. <laughs> yeah, I didn't update my website in years and years and years until that meme went around where people were posting like, oh, if you're an independent creative professional or small business owner, post your website. And it was like, oh, I guess yeah. I have to redo my website to participate in this meme. So well, that was the excuse. What's particularly bad is that I just had in some ways my most high profile professional moment yet, which was being announced in Deadline as one of the Outfest 2020 Screenwriting Lab fellows. And I really said to myself, I need to get my, I need to get my website updated before that goes by because there will be people looking at me. Well, I didn't. So, whoops. Speaking of, there you go. There's time and the moment when you're supposed to act, the moment when you need to cut the hachia because it's ripe. And uh, I did not. I let that hachia persimmon rot. There will be other opportunities, but I need to get that done. <laughs> <laughs> well, Good luck with that in 2021. And Gary, thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. And the goal is to have it before New Year's. So so let's get it done in 2020. All right. But this is a light. And I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.